All right, for this last video, I'm going to show you how you can get some easy points. First off, uh, the last thing we have to do with delta G is, deals with phase change. We can use Gibbs equation to calculate the, fa the temperature at which a phase change is going to occur. And we can do this because we know at, uh, at, during a phase change, there's an equilibrium that's reached between the different phases. And that's why temperature doesn't increase until you have either evaporated or boiled off everything, or either boiled off everything or you've melted it. So there's an equilibrium that exists. And at equilibrium, delta G equals zero. So if we know that delta G equals zero, we can use that information to determine what the temperature is, what the thermodynamic boiling point or melting point of something could be. So let's look at one of these. So here we're asked to find the thermodynamic boiling point of water as it goes from liquid to gas. And we're given a delta H and a delta S. So the Gibbs equation again is delta G equals delta H minus T times delta S. So let's go ahead and put that on here. And we're at equilibrium because we're going through this phase change. So delta G is therefore going to have to equal zero. We're given delta H and delta uh, S. We're looking for a temperature. So if we rearrange this equation so that we have T equals something, let's go ahead and do that. So first off, we subtract delta H from both sides. We can, oops, we subtracted that delta H. Uh, we can uh, multi, uh, divide by a negative one, so we end up with a positive number on both sides. Uh, divide by delta S, and we end up with a T, delta H over delta S. So then it's just a matter of plugging in our values and making sure they have the correct, no, the correct units. So delta H is going to be 44 kilojoules, and this should say per mole. And same down here, joules per Kelvin mole, but those will just end up canceling out anyways. And we get 44 kilojoules per mole divided by 118.8 joules per Kelvin mole. Again, these units don't cancel out, so we need to make sure we've got the same unit. So let's change this joules to kilojoules by dividing by 1,000, and we get... 0 0.1188 kilojoules per Kelvin mole. And what we do is we, what we find that T equals T equals 300, 370 kilojoules or Kelvin. Which is fine because this is an approximation. It's not an absolute. So even though we know that water boils at 373 Kelvin. This is um, an approximation. So these values that you're going to get are going to be approximations. So if you're ever asked why is your value different than the actual known value, it's because this is an approximation. But this is something quick and easy, and there's a lot of easy multiple choice points tied to it. Some more quick and dirty and easy multiple choice points. Uh, deal with whether or not reaction will be spontaneous or not. So remember that anytime we have a positive delta G, that means it is a non-spontaneous reaction. Every time you have a negative delta G, it means that it will be spontaneous. So you can either memorize the conditions, or you can remember the formula delta G equals delta H minus T delta S. The way I remember the formula is ghetto homies take speed. So if we have a negative delta H and we have a positive delta S, that means this value for this multiplication is also going to be positive. So a negative minus a negative, well, that's always going to be negative. So spontaneous at all temperatures, doesn't matter what T is, because it's always going to be some negative value. If delta H is positive and delta S is positive, only if T is some huge number some large number, will that be, well, it's got to be big enough to override this delta H to make this into a negative number. If delta H is negative and delta S is negative, 
if delta S is negative and you multiply it by something large enough to override delta H, you're going to end up with a positive value. So delta G would be positive, so not spontaneous, except at low temperatures. And lastly, if delta H is positive and delta S is negative, we will never be spontaneous because that's always going to come out to be positive. If we look at free energy and its relationship to equilibrium and electromotive uh, force, E, anytime we're at equilibrium, so K is going to equal zero, our delta G is going to be zero, is going to be zero. And since we're at equilibrium, that means the battery is dead, so our electrostatic potential is also going to be zero. If we have a negative delta G, it means we're spontaneous. That means we're producing products, so we're, product, we're, we're going to have a, uh, a number greater than one for K. We're going to be favoring the production of products. And in the case of electrostatic force, in the case of electrochemistry, that means that we are going through a spontaneous reaction. We are actually... Uh, producing energy. So we'd have a positive E here. If E is negative, that means we have a positive delta G because it's a non-spontaneous reaction and the production of reactants are favored. The graphs on your notes are actually show up uh, more often than you might think and they deal with that at equilibrium we've reached our delta G. So where equilibrium occurs, we've reached delta G. So in the forward reaction, as we produce more and more products, more and more of A is being used up and more of B is being produced. Once we reach equilibrium, though, that reverses and we start producing more of A and B is being used up. So the entire graph shows that this dip, if we actually had numbers here, we could calculate a K value. This dip is simply the place at which equilibrium is reached. So each point on the curve corresponds to the total free energy of the system for a given combination of A or B. Delta G isn't only useful for determining whether or not something is spontaneous, it also helps us understand the maximum amount of work that a system either is producing or requires. If delta G is, uh, is positive, that tells us the amount of work available by that system. However, if delta G is negative, that's the amount of work the system needs in order to do whatever it is you're looking at. And that concludes free energy.